Wow. Uh, good morning. Thanks, everybody. Um, on May 21st, 1945, the 77th U.S. Infantry retreated from a cliff in Okinawa, Japan. After taking massive casualties, about 100 men and a unit of 155, commanders decided to cut their losses and make a costly retreat. That night, though, something incredible happened. One man, alone, ran into the thick of battle. This one man brought back nearly 75 of those injured Americans and lowered them down the cliff to safety. You see, Desmond Doss was a person just like you or I, but he was willing to make tough choices. Doss was a conscientious objector, so he went into the whole war without a weapon, but he wasn't unarmed. He's quoted to have prayed out loud, Lord, please let me get one more after lowering each and every man to safety. You see, sometimes our lives feel like battlegrounds, just like that one. On one hand, we have the devil tempting us to sin. On the other, the world glorifies sin and idolatry and throws it in our faces. And to top it all off, our flesh wants to sin. But let's see what the Bible has to say about this. Turn with me to 2 Kings 18. Hezekiah, king of Judah, faced these issues head-on in his day. At the time, Israel and Judah were pursuing all sorts of idolatry and witchcraft. They dedicated high places to worship false gods and to falsely worship the one true God. And they were worshiping an idol fastened, fashioned after the bronze snake that Moses had made while the Israelites were wandering in the desert. To make matters worse, Assyria was oppressing the land and even threatened Jerusalem. But let's look at what Hezekiah does in verse 6. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands that the Lord had given to Moses. Did you catch that? Hezekiah trusted God and obeyed him, even when the rest of the world was turned against God. Brothers and sisters, this is how we want to model our lives. Let's dive in and see how God teaches us through Hezekiah to trust and obey. Now, as we mentioned previously, idolatry was rampant in Israel and Judah, pretty much from the death of Solomon all the way up to the exile. There were many different pagan cults at different times, but they all had a few things in common. None of these false religions were exclusive. In fact, the cultures encouraged worship of different deities to help with different problems. Further, each religion encouraged the people to model their worship of the one true God after false worship of idols. The children of Israel were worshiping in whichever way seemed best to them at whatever place is convenient, rather than following the law as given through Moses. And even though it might look different, we still see idolatry like this today, right? I mean, we don't worship Asherah or Moloch or Baal, but if we want something we can't afford, we might worship money. Or maybe if we're lonely, we'll worship a relationship. Other times, when we're uneasy, we worship comfort. But if you've been here during our Exodus series, you'll know that this is a big no-no. Now, what's our first commandment? We are to have no other gods before him. We are to trust God for all that we need and to obey his commands. We are not to follow the example of Jeroboam, who led the northern kingdom into idolatry just after the death of Solomon. And we're certainly not to follow the example of Judah, which, as we see in 1 Kings 14, joined him without hesitation. Jeroboam, king of Israel, made idols for the people at Bethel and Dan. And Rehoboam, son of Solomon, permitted Judah to make high places and Asherah poles. Now, you might say, where's the outrage against all this idolatry? I mean, Judah even had good kings, right? And, you know, that's, that's true. Um, the Bible mentions several good kings of Judah. Uh, in fact, Joash, Amaziah, Azariah, and Jotham are all described as doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. But brothers and sisters, this is insufficient. There's a phrase repeated over and over in First and Second Kings, and it's used to characterize each of these men. Let me read it for you from the account of Joash in Second Kings 12. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. You see, we can trace this path of idolatry and partial devotion all the way from the death of Solomon over here 
through the generations to the exile. God plus anything else is insufficient. Full devotion is required. Obedience is necessary. Let me remind you now that most people we see in the Bible are mirrors for reflection, not forms to follow. So now we set the stage, and onto it walks Hezekiah. Same age as me, he gets put in charge of a country. And what's his first act as king? Well, full obedience to God. Unlike those other kings who did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not completely, Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Second Chronicles chapters 30 and 31 tell this story in more detail. Hezekiah brings the people of Judah and Israel together to celebrate the Passover corporately for the first time since the death of Solomon. At the conclusion of the festival, the king encourages the people, and they go throughout Judah, Benjamin, and all of Israel, destroying high places, sacred stones, Asherah poles, and all manner of idolatrous symbols. And what do we learn from this? Well, we learn that we are to do the same, right? This is spiritual warfare, and the Bible tells us in uh, Ephesians 6 that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In this case, spiritual warfare meant a scorched earth campaign against the destruction of idol worship. But it's not always that literal, right? Sometimes spiritual warfare means obeying God and forgiving that person who's just driving you nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Other times, it's as simple as consistent, faithful prayer for those in your life who don't know Jesus. For Hezekiah, this warfare was just as literal as it was spiritual. Fourteen years into Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, surrounded Jerusalem. Now, we don't know how big his army was, probably hundreds of thousands, but it was substantial. Assyria had conquered numerous other countries in the area, including the northern kingdom of Israel. So the Assyrian army is camped outside of Jerusalem, right? They're doing their thing, preparing for a siege, and Hezekiah gets this letter. And what does he do? Well, he reads it, and Sennacherib is boasting. He says, don't let the God you depend on deceive you when he says, Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. He says, surely you've heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all, all the countries, destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? Did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my forefathers deliver them? Now, he goes on to list some specifics, but I think we get the gist, right? Sennacherib is saying, don't trust God. Don't you see all this stuff that we've done? You know, it's pretty bad. Pretty dire situation. But let's take a look at how we are to respond with this, when we're faced with a situation where the odds are insurmountable. Verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it. Stuff and go hire the fanciest lawyers to go beat this guy in court. And certainly he doesn't foolishly go out there and throw his life away in some sort of ill-fated attempt at retaliation. No. What does Hezekiah do? He takes the letter... He goes to the temple, he spreads it out, and he prays. And he prays, It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations and their lands. They have thrown down their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone, fashioned by men's hands. Now, O Lord our God, deliver us from his hands, so that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. So, what happens next? Well, God was faithful to Hezekiah, and God is faithful to us. God prophesied the downfall of Assyria, and that very night, the angel of the Lord goes out and strikes down 185,000 men of the Assyrian army. The next morning, Sennacherib, the king, wakes up. 
He sees the devastation, and he withdraws, leaving Jerusalem free. Now, does this mean that if we pray and trust God that all of our problems are going to go away? If I said yes to that, I'd be lying to you. In truth, the Christian life is hard. It's not easy. But God is faithful. We read on. Oh, nope. We don't read on. <laughs> Let's see what he says about the Assyrian army and what he says about the trials we face. 2 Kings 19.25 Have you not heard? Long ago I ordained it. In the days of old I planned it. And now I have brought it to pass that you, speaking about Assyria, have turned fortified cities into piles of stone. You see, God is the ultimate goal setter. God is the ultimate planner. When he decrees something, it will come to pass. And there's nothing that you or I or anybody else in the whole earth can do about it. Yeah, amen. (laughs) But what has God planned for us? Well, in a couple minutes, Paul's going to tell us a little bit more about that. But... For now, if you know Christ, we have one statement of that, one very clear statement of that. Those that God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he, speaking about Jesus, might be firstborn among many brothers. Through Christ's death and resurrection, God has taken us out of our Egypt. But there's still work to do to take Egypt out of us. To this end, he ordains all circumstances for his glory and our good. So, if you're driving in your car and you hit a mailbox, it's for his glory and our good. Yeah. If you fall, break an ankle, and have to have major surgery, it's for his glory and our good. And when somebody overlooks you for that promotion, trust God, because it's for his glory and our good. And when God says to trust him, it's not without reason. This very same God is sovereign over everything. And he's the only one who's sovereign. So give him your full devotion. He alone is worthy. Hear, O Israel, and hear, O church. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Don't give in to complacency. Instead, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles And let us run with perseverance the race mark out for us. Now, what are we holding before God? Is it porn? Throw off the porn. Is it comfort? Throw it off. Be uncomfortable for God. Is it money? No one can serve two masters. Either we'll love the one and hate the other, or we'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. We cannot serve both God and money. And this is true for any idol in our lives. We can either love God or we can love our idols. Now, this is where we'll end today, but remember this. Hezekiah's life shows us the importance of full devotion to God. It's not enough to have God plus. Will you obey God completely and rid your life of idols today? Hezekiah recognized God's sovereignty over all aspects of life. It doesn't matter if you're facing an army or just a work day. God is sovereign and he is trustworthy. Will you trust him? Let's follow the example of Hezekiah. Let's trust and obey. So, where do we go from here? Well, if you're not a follower of Christ, that's easy. Follow him, right? Um, Romans tells us that before we knew Christ, we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. But Christ died to wipe those away. All you have to do is trust Jesus as your Savior. And just let me say, if that's you, If today is the day where you've decided to follow Christ, or if you just want to know more, please don't keep that to yourself. You can talk to any of us preaching today, or Pastor Reg, or someone else that you trust after the service. We'd love to rejoice with you and welcome you into the trust and obedience of God. Now, if you're already a follower of Christ, I have just two next steps for you today. First, whatever you're worried about, whether it's work or health issues or family troubles, Trust that God alone is sovereign over that. Trust that God is somehow using it to make you more like Christ. And let me just acknowledge, this is really hard, right? But it's what God commands us to do. And it brings life and peace when we recognize that he is in control and cast our cares upon him. 
And our second next step is much like it. So first, we trust that God is in control, and we obey all of his commands. And secondly, we obey all of his commands. Fortunately, God's commands are not burdensome. Rather, when we follow them, we flourish. All right, one more time. We trust God, and we obey him completely. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy with Jesus than to trust and obey. As I close, I just have one more thought for you. The consequences for disobedience and lack of trust are much more difficult than actions of total obedience and total trust. If you don't believe me, ask Jonah how he got in the belly of that fish. All right, let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for being here with us this morning and continuing to teach us more about you. Um, Father, I ask that you um, open all of our hearts to see uh, our idols in our lives and give us the power and the desire to put them down and throw them off. Lord, I pray that you'll also show us those places where we're not trusting that you're in control and give us a heart of surrender. I ask that you do all this in your precious name.